precious name that we pray. Amen. The scripture today is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Thanks, Bailey. Good morning, my friends. I have uh, <clears throat> last week, let's see if that's correct, the week before last, we uh, had our summer camp and uh, I came home, a number of us leaders, as a matter of fact, and some of the kids came home with uh, colds. I'm still recovering that, so if my voice sounds a little congested, that's why that is. Uh, let me say, first of all, though, that it's good to see each and every one of you guys, and if you are new or visiting, I'm Slade Reinhardt, I'm the, <laughs> I'm going to get this right one day, it'll just flow right off my tongue. I am the Director of Youth Ministry and Discipleship, I think, I think that's my title. Uh, I also want to say it is great to see Todd Malone back, as well as the rest of the Philippines team. Uh, I know you guys had a blessed time over there, and I did get to see a short video clip of Todd eating durian, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, before I get into the sermon, I did want to remind you about one thing. Uh, earlier, uh, during the missions moment, you saw John McGlott up here on the stage, and just as a reminder, if you want to connect with them and hear more about their ministry he and uh, probably his wife are going to be out in the foyer right after service by the missions uh, wall, and that is to my left, uh, your right in the foyer there. Well, I am uh, privileged to bring to you the fifth message in our sermon series, DTR, which stands for Define the Relationship. The focus of these messages is the church, what the church is and what the church does. And our hope and prayer is that through these messages, you are able to more clearly define your relationship both to the church and to the Lord. You just heard the passage read by Bailey, uh, who honestly can read much better than I. <laughs> it's excellent. She has such great uh, enunciation. So if you haven't turned there already, go ahead and go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, because that's where we will be. This is a picture of the original X-Men. The X-Men were a uh, superhero team that first uh, came to print in 1963 in Marvel Comics. And in the comic book universe, the X-Men were a group formed by Professor Charles Xavier, also, also known as Professor X. Who, and he uh, brought together a group of people who were hated and feared in order to give them guidance and a place to belong. The common bond that formed the basis of being on the X-Men was not where you were born or your skin color or your education or your economic status. It was something that was inside each of these people that were called to be on this team. And it was that they were each mutants, which meant that they were born with superhuman abilities. And on that basis, they were chosen to be part of this new people, this new group called the X-Men. And like the X-Men, the church is a new kind of people. We are bound together not by language, not by place of birth, not by economic status or skin color or education. We are bound together by something inside each of us, and that is that each of us who are part of the church have been born again of the Spirit. We have uh, been united by the Spirit of God living in each of us. Now, the passage this morning highlights this particular aspect of the church, that we are God's people. We are a special kind of people. And in this sermon series, you've been reminded that the church is the body of Christ, that the church is God's holy temple, that the church is a family. So this morning, we're just going to look briefly at what the Bible has to say about the church as God's people. There are three truths in this passage that I want to expound upon, and the first is this. God has created the church to be his people. God has created the church to be his people. 
Look at verses 9 and 10 again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now keep in mind as we're going through this passage, whenever you see the word you, think of the word y'all, because this is actually the plural form of the word you. This is what, sorry, I should swallow before I talk. This is one of the, uh, one of the ways in which the uh, Southern culture has improved upon the English language because we do have a word that differentiates between a singular you and a plural you. So think of y'all. Peter is, <laughs> Peter is talking to uh, the church as a group. He's not talking to a single individual. And he tells us that we are God's people, and he uses four terms that he lifted out of the Old Testament to help us see just how uh, blessed this status is of being God's people. Now, the first term he uses is a chosen race, and that comes from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 20 and 21, God speaking and says, I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Now, I know you didn't come ready for a quiz, but I'm going to quiz you a little bit in the, the next few seconds. Who is Isaiah talking about? Who, who are these chosen people? Israel, yes, excellent. Uh, the... the uh, the chosen race that he is talking about is the nation of Israel that God called out from all, among all the other uh, peoples of the world. Now, Isaiah, excuse me, uh, Exodus chapter 15, 19. I can't read. Exodus chapter 19 is where these other allusions come to. I'm going to draw this together in a second. But listen to this from Exodus 19, 5 and 6. This is God speaking again. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So both the Isaiah passage and the Exodus passage are directly addressing the people of Israel. So uh, here's the last quiz question for you. How can Peter take those things that were applied directly to Israel and say, now that is true of the church? How can he do that? I have a feeling that Brianna Beamer knows the answer. What's the answer to all my questions in youth group on Wednesday nights? Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> Jesus. Because of Jesus. Thank you, Brianna. Because of Jesus. Ephesians 2 says that, uh, where was I? Ephesians 2 says the Gentiles, non-Israelites, were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. So in our natural state, those things that Peter just talked about that were quoted from Exodus and Isaiah do not apply to us. But then something changed. Ephesians 2 continues, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. Jesus has made both Jews and Gentiles, Israelites and non-Israelites, one in him, both the chosen people of God. Theologian Michael Horton puts it this way. Thus it becomes clear that we are dealing not with two peoples, so they're not two peoples of God, but with one, and not with a displacement of Israel, but with its enlargement. While the national covenant has come to an end, the theocracy, the Abrahamic covenant, according to which all nations will be blessed in Abraham and his seed, has reached its appointed goal. Jew and Gentile in Christ form one flock with one shepherd, not a replacement for the ancient people of God, but the Israel of God indeed, quoting from Galatians chapter 6. Peter can apply these promises, these blessings, these glorious privileges to the church because through Jesus we have now been brought into the chosen people of God. Jews and Gentiles make up the chosen people of God in Christ. And think about this as well. Jesus was a son of Israel directly descended according to the flesh as a child of Israel. So those promises would have been directly to him. And because he perfectly fulfilled the condition in Exodus chapter 19, where it says, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, 
Jesus did obey the voice of the Father perfectly. He did keep the covenant of the Father perfectly. Because of that, he can lay claim to that promise. And when we trust in him, we are united to him. And everything that is Christ's is now ours. The promise extends to us because we are united to him. The victory Christ won is ours. The righteousness he possesses is ours. The inheritance is ours. And the promises are ours. Because Jesus graciously and mercifully gave his life for us to redeem us and make us his own. Because of Christ, we can enjoy these same spiritual blessings that were promised to Israel. You, the church, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now think for just a second about what that means. You are a chosen race, a group of people chosen by God himself. Not a group of people that just stumbled together, a group of people chosen by God himself. You are a royal priesthood, which means you have direct access to God because of Christ. He says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace because of the living, excuse me, because of the priest that we have in Jesus Christ. And you are a royal priest because you're part of the royal family because you are now a child of the king of kings. You are a holy nation, a people set apart from all other people, set apart from the unbelieving world, and set apart for God. You are a people for his own possession, a people that stand in unique relationship to God, a people that he bought with his own blood. Church, we are God's people. Everyone who has put their faith in Christ Jesus is now one of God's people. Think back to when you were a kid. And kids, just think about now, because you are a kid. You know how sometimes you would meet an adult, like in a store, or at school, or at church, or in your neighborhood, and in the course of talking to you, they would sometimes ask, and who do you belong to? Asking, of course, who, who, is, who are your parents? Well, our answer, our ultimate and final answer as the church is, we belong to God. Who do we belong to? We belong to God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that should be a comfort to us. To know that whatever you go through, whatever trials you face, whatever times you falter and fail, that you always and forever belong to God who has chosen you to be part of his family. The first question of the old Heidelberg Catechism is this, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, you are God's people. You belong to him. You are chosen by him, set apart by him, and loved by him. Amen. The second truth I want you to consider is that God's people proclaim his glory. God's people proclaim his glory. Every one of us has run into someone that is a graduate of one of these two schools, the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M University. Hey, nobody whooped. That's excellent. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. I threw myself off. So we, yes, where was I? Okay, we've all run into graduates of these two colleges, right? These are the two biggest universities in Texas. They both have a long and storied tradition. They're very influential. And if you meet someone that's a graduate of one of these two places, sometimes even if you meet somebody that was there for just a semester, I think that's another story. Uh, If you meet someone that's a graduate of one of these two universities, they are more than happy, in fact, overjoyed and enthusiastic to tell you how great these universities are. They'll tell you about how marvelous their sports program is, how great the education is, how fantastic the campus experience is. They will proclaim the glory of Texas A&M and the University of Texas at Austin. And that is what God wants For his people to do. We are created to be God's people for a purpose, and that is to glorify God. Excuse me, I have to swallow. (laughs) That's what the Lord intends for his church to be, a people who proclaim his glory. Just like the Aggies and the Longhorns will tell you the great things about their universities, what they've done and what they're like, we are to tell the world around us, as well as each other, how great God is and what he has done. Look at verse 9 again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are God's people in order that 
or for the purpose of proclaiming his excellencies. Now, that word excellencies can refer to a couple of different concepts. One way to think of it is, is the virtuous, virtues or the virtuous characteristics of God. And another way to think of it is the mighty acts of God. So it's both who God is as well as what he has done. We're to tell the world about God's virtues. God is almighty. God is patient. He's holy. He's forgiving. And we tell the world about his mighty acts. God created everything in the entire universe. God delivered a nation out of slavery without using any military intervention. It was purely miraculous. God brought dead people back to life. We talk about God's mighty acts. And what is the pinnacle of all of God's mighty acts? It is the work of redemption that Jesus of Nazareth accomplished. The gospel contains the story of this highest and greatest act of God. In his matchless love for humanity, the Father sent the Son to become a man. He lived a perfect and sinless life. And then he died willingly a bloody and painful death on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. But then he rose from the dead victorious over death, hell, and the grave and offers forgiveness and life to all who will trust in him. This is the gospel, and we should talk about it regularly with one another as well as the watching world. Talking about the greatness of God should flow naturally from our status as God's people. Peter is listing all these privileges we have, and then he basically is saying, now, because all this is true, now this should be happening as well. That we're proclaiming his glory. Look at what God has done for us. Look at how glorious God is. Now, one aspect of our corporate worship our corporate worship services is that we are regularly proclaiming God's glory and God's gospel. We sing about it, we preach about it, we pray about it, we thank God for it. But we all know that isn't the end of it, right? We should be proclaiming God's glory and God's gospel to our friends, our neighbors, and our relatives. And how do we do that? Because it would be really awkward to walk up to your neighbor and say, Hey, Thompson, good to see you, man. The yard looks great. How are the kids doing? Oh, by the way, Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead. Nobody shares the gospel. Well, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Most people do not share the gospel like that. But I have known a lot of people who are able to weave the truths of the gospel and the great things about God into the normal course of their conversations. You're talking to your neighbor about how crazy the world has become, and you say something like, at least I can rest in the fact that God is sovereign and he's in control, even though everything looks like chaos. Now, that's a very low-key statement, but what you have done is just proclaimed one of God's excellencies, that he is the sovereign king of the universe. Now, I mentioned that I've known people like that, people in this very congregation come to mind that are that way, just consistently giving praise and honor to God, consistently pointing back to him. Uh, I am not one of those people, so this verse is, uh, convicts me strongly about that. Thank the Lord that his love for me is perfect, but my love for him is not. And uh, so what I, my challenge to you is to think about your own conversations as I have been doing. How often does the Lord feature in your conversations when you're talking about how you're doing, what your plans are, what you love, that kind of thing? And if you find, like me, that you're very lacking in that area... Then just go to the Lord, tell him that, and ask him to help you love him more. Ask him to, for it to become more natural so that you don't have to tell Thompson just out of the blue that Jesus died for him. But that's not a bad thing to tell him. God's people proclaim his glory. And finally, God's people make his glory visible. God's people make his glory visible. During the Revolutionary War, one of the methods that was used for espionage was invisible ink. What they would do is they would have a very innocent letter written with a space between the lines, and then they would go back and write messages about troop movements or strategies, secret uh, information one general wanted to get to another, and they would write it in an ink that would very quickly disappear from sight. And so then if the messenger was captured or detained by the enemy and the letter was found, then no secret, Im no secret information would be leaked. And once the secret letter got to, uh, excuse me, once the letter got to its intended recipient, there was a special chemical that would be applied that would then cause those other letters to become visible. Now, the truth about God and what he's done are like that message in invisible ink. The message remained unseen until someone with inside information 
did something to make it visible. Unbelievers are blind and ignorant about the things of God. They need someone with inside information that can bring it to visibility, that can help them see the excellencies of God. So part of our mission as God's people is to make his glory visible. We have to proclaim his excellencies and we have to display those excellencies. So how do we do that? Let's look at verses 11 and 12 again. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. One way to make God's glory visible is to abstain from the passions of the flesh. And when he says passions of the flesh, he's talking about all sinful desires. So that would include sexual immorality as well as pride and hatred and envy and a hundred other things. These sinful desires are fighting against the well-being of your soul. These desires work against the health of your soul, battering it with temptation or doubt or despair. And since you're God's people, Peter says, abstain from these things. Now, that's very simple to say, right? Have you you ever experienced that? Just remember it now. Adults, think back to when you were kids as well. And kids, again, you can just think about your current state. When your parent finds out that you've been doing something wrong, you have this bad habit. Let's suppose it's biting your fingernails. And then your parent will just say, well, stop doing that. It's a habit. I can't just stop. It's a habit. Well, that's kind of the way it is with sin, right? Sin is, is a habit for us in addition to the fact that we're, we're tempted by the devil and our, and our own flesh. So it's not a simple thing just to say, well, just abstain. Just stop doing it. But God is there to help. God is there to strengthen. And let's be real. There's nobody in this room that is always abstaining from the passions of the flesh. Every one of us sins and falls, and then we run to Christ, of course, for forgiveness and restoration. But one of the ways that we make the glory of God visible is by fighting against those passions. So when he says abstain from it, that doesn't mean you've got to have this perfect record of never falling into sin. But it does mean when sin is creeping up in your life that you're battling against it. You're fighting against it by the strength of the Spirit. And when you're doing that, you are sending a message to those around you that God is more important than this sin. That obedience to God is greater pleasure than the joy that this sin will give you. You're sending the message to the people around you that you are a child of the living God and you love Him and you want to please Him. So that's one way to make God's glory visible. Second way that he mentions in verse 12... Living honorable lives, make your, make your conduct among the Gentiles, speaking in this case of unbelievers in general, honorable, and later he says, so that they'll see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So this honorable lives he's talking about living is a life where you are showing love to your neighbor, where you are serving them, where you are meeting needs, where you're reaching out, that kind of thing. Because those good deeds give weight to your words about God. The text says that they will glorify God on the day of visitation. And as far as I'm able to understand that phrase, what Peter is saying, when the time comes that God visits by his spirit to draw that person to salvation because of the foundation that your good deeds have laid, they will be receptive and they will glorify God rather than rejecting him. Our good works, our honorable lives show the beauty of the gospel Pastor and author Jeff Vanderstelt calls this combination of proclaiming God's glory and making it visible show and tell. And he came up with an exercise called Gospel Metaphors that he uses to help believers show and tell God's glory to unbelievers. So here's how it works. You think about some of the attributes or activities of God that you see in Christ. Uh, He is a forgiver. He is a healer. He's a redeemer. He's a friend of sinners, so on and so forth. And then you take one of those attributes and together with other believers, for instance, your small group or your life group, you come up with a way to show that aspect of God to unbelievers in your neighborhood or community. So let's, decide, let's, let's say you decided to do a gospel meta- metaphor on God as provider. So you look around for a need in your neighborhood or community, and you and this group of believers, you go and you meet that need. And then when that need is met and the people that you have blessed are thanking you or asking you why you do it, then you point back to Christ. We're providing for you because Christ has provided for us. And that acts as a metaphor to that unbeliever of, oh, this is what God is like. And it points them toward him. 
Now, if that sounds like a somewhat familiar scenario, it should, because that is exactly what our church does every year with the 21.5 projects. We look for needs in the community, we gather together as believers, and then we meet those needs, and in the course of interacting with the people whose needs are being met, we point them to Christ. You have blessed someone, you've pointed them toward Christ as the ultimate source of that blessing, so you have both shown and you have told the glory of God. God's people make his glory visible. The point is this, we are God's people, created by him to proclaim and display his glory. The church is not a man-made institution. It was created by God himself to be his people. And as his people, we have the responsibility and the blessing to show his glory, to tell of his glory. In closing, let me go over a few ways that you can respond to God's word today. First of all, you can study. You can commit to going through the reflection and discussion questions at the, uh, the end of the sermon notes that are also online with another believer or a group of believers. The truth of God was never meant to be explored or enjoyed outside of community. God created us to be a people, so let's explore our relationship with God. Let's explore his truth together. Another response would be to share To proclaim God's glory by telling someone how God has been good to you. I mean, we all, every believer here has 10,000 reasons, to to, uh, coin a song, 10,000 reasons that God has been good to them. 10,000 ways that he's been good to them. I still didn't say that right. I apologize. (laughs) Share that with somebody this week. It can be another believer or it can be an unbeliever. But tell someone how God has been good to you. You can also pray. Praise the Lord for making you one of his people. No one on earth deserved to be one of God's people. But God in his grace and his mercy reached out to us and drew us to himself. And finally, there's a way you can practice, and that would be to look for ways to display God's glory to others. Look for ways that you can be or make a gospel metaphor in the life of another Now, we always end our services with prayer, as you know. Uh, Today is going to be a little bit different in that respect. Our 40 Days of Prayer campaign is beginning today. So uh, the last segment of our service this morning will be an extended time of prayer. And our lead pastor, Todd Malone, will be leading us in that. So I'll go ahead and invite him up and turn that over to him.